16. Luke chapter 16. And follow along as we read the first 13 verses. Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through verse 13. And Jesus said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fail, they may receive in, uh, you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus here presents a parable about an unjust steward. And... There are a lot of valuable lessons that we can learn from this particular parable. And some of those lessons have to deal indirectly with what's being said as opposed to what's directly being said. And I think as we uh, look at this particular text, you'll see what I mean. We begin looking at the fact that Jesus here is speaking a parable. The Bible tells us that he is speaking primarily, uh, verse 14, to uh, a group of individuals who consider themselves Pharisees. Verse 14 also gives us a very important note about the context in which this parable is given. The Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things, and they derided Jesus. It's important for us to understand context. I speak of context often because of its great importance. If we miss the context, we're going to miss the meaning. And I'm afraid that with uh, respect to this particular parable, uh, we may have either not understood the meaning clearly, or we may have applied meanings that don't exist. And some meanings uh, are taught other, other places in the scripture, which mean that they're scriptural, but we shouldn't try to make a parable say something if it doesn't say it. So with the idea that the Pharisees heard what Jesus said, and because of their covetousness, uh, the idea of their greed and their wanting of other people's stuff uh, is what caused them to deride Jesus. That should give us a hint about what's being talked about here. So there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted the Lord's goods. And the Lord, in this particular parable, called the steward and said, How is it that I hear this about thee? 
Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest be no longer my steward. So here we have a certain rich man who apparently has so much riches that he's being cheated and really doesn't know about it until somebody tells him about it. Now that's having a lot of riches, <laughs> right? When you're being cheated, someone's cheating you and you've got so much riches that you don't even know about it till I heard you were cheating me. I hear that you're uh, not taking care of my goods as you ought to. You're my steward and you're not taking care of my goods. So the Lord in this particular parable has so much riches, is so wealthy, that he doesn't need any more wealth. That's not the point. And to be cheated, it's, he's still wealthy even though he's being cheated. <laughs> but the, the man has a steward, and the steward has a job to do, and the steward is to work for the Lord in this particular parable. And the steward's job is to make sure that whatever he's been put in charge of is handled correctly. Now, that's just being respectful to your employer, right? Making sure that you do what you're supposed to do. Taking care of your job. Dealing with the, your contractual agreement, right? The steward had made an agreement with this employer, and the steward was not fulfilling his obligations. Uh, in fact, he was being unjust. He was cheating uh, in some form or fashion, uh, wasting the goods of the Lord, the employer in this particular parable, so much so that it was brought to the attention of the, of the Lord in the parable. A steward is one who is supposed to manage something on behalf of someone above him. And in this particular context, it could be the fact that he was managing other uh, properties. He could have been managing uh, other lands. He could have been, uh, we might refer to stewards in the context of banking or taking care of someone else's finances. Uh, we might think of stewards who take care of someone's affairs while they're gone, right? We see all those uh, definitions of a steward throughout parables and in other aspects of the scripture. Stewards were basically uh, employees taking care of something, uh, being given a, a job to do to oversee something, right? Sometimes uh, stewards um, in the first century were bond servants. Uh, they were take. They were. Uh, provided uh, with uh, a place to live and provided with uh, all the things that they needed to live, food and so forth, in order to take, uh, in order for them to take care of the Lord's or the, uh, the employer's goods. In other words, it was, uh, I'll take care of your needs as long as you take care of my finances or my properties or my lands or my farm or whatever it is. This was not the case in this particular text. It does not seem that this man was in any way obligated to pay off some debt to the, to the Lord because the Lord says, I can fire you, <laughs> right? You won't be my steward anymore. So the, uh, the steward in this case wasn't paying off a debt himself. He was a free man. But he had mismanaged the goods or whatever he was taking care of. And based upon the context, which is extremely important, verse 3, uh, the steward said within himself, what shall I do? The idea being if I lose my job, if I'm not the man's steward anymore. For my Lord will take away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig, that is I don't have the health to, to, to work a labor with my hands. And I'm not going to beg because I'm too proud to beg. I'm ashamed to beg. So I'm resolved that if I lose my job, I'll just be put out. And I'll have to receive that they may receive me into their houses. And so it seems here that uh, his emphasis on houses is that this man may have been taking care of rental properties or something of that case. That this man was uh, the uh, a management overseer of houses or lands or properties and they would come and pay their debts for that house or land or properties and then he would give that to the uh, to the landowner 
and the, the, the context makes it seem like if I'm not the steward, then I'm going to be coming to them asking for a place to live because I won't have one myself. I'll be looking for a place to live. But the Lord, in this context, uh, calls upon the steward to give an account. Now, accountability is something we see throughout the whole Bible. God required uh, accountability in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. They were called upon to give an account for what they did. Abel, Cain. When Cain slew Abel, God gave, made Cain accountable. And he made him stand accountable for his decision. He said, and you'll remember Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And the, the implied the rhetorical response was, I asked you the question, therefore yes. There's an account. You have to give an account for how you do your business. And so we might learn that as a lesson from stewardship, that uh, we're to give an account. We're to stand accountable for whatever we do, for what we say. That can be applied to how we worship, how we live with God. And in this context, we're to give an account for how we treat fe our fellow man. This individual was to give an account to his employer. His employer had given him a job, and this guy had obviously mismanaged all the funds or finances from this particular endeavor. And uh, he was supposed to give an account. And when we think of an account, we think of it in the financial terms uh, the, of counting money, giving an account. Uh, but it doesn't have to always uh, deal with money. When it comes to employer-employee relationships, a lot of time it does. But it may just be, how did you use your time while you were employed under this employer? Did you do what you were requested to do or what we contracted you out to do, right? Uh, did you use your time the way you said you would or that we agreed upon it? Did you use the materials that we agreed upon? Did you, do, did you actually come up with the result that we agreed upon, right? So there's an obligation here. And the master here says that the steward was required to give an account. But now we find that the steward wasn't ready to give an account. Was he? <laughs> If the employer in this particular text had, uh, had decided it's time for you to give an account, he would have fired him because he didn't have anything to give to him. The landowner obviously had heard correctly that the steward had mismanaged the funds, had wasted the funds. It reminds me of Luke 15, the previous chapter, where we read of the prodigal son, right? In Luke 15, verse 13, uh, the Bible says, um, And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Well, I think we might look at the steward in this case and say that this steward took his substance, which wasn't his. It was supposed to go to the Lord of the manor, right? He took this substance and he wasted it. And I think we, based uh, on, on the context, can say he wasted it with riotous living. In other words, he was living as if he were the Lord of all the manor. As if this was his to do whatever he wanted to. And he didn't have to give an account to someone above him. Now the person above him says, it's time for you to give an account. And he's wasted all this substance, right? He doesn't have anything to give. That's the man's predicament. So this man comes up with a solution, right? <laughs> his solution is based on the, on the fear of losing his own house and losing his job, his stewardship. He liked his job. He was in a position of authority. And he didn't want to have to work with his hands laboriously. And he didn't want to have to beg and so he wanted to keep his job. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep your job. And there's nothing wrong with thinking of good ways to keep your job. This man, unfortunately, uh, thought in a very unrighteous way to keep his job. And so that he wouldn't have to go and beg for a house from someone who took his job. 
So he calls every one of his Lord's debtors unto him, and he said unto the first, now this is probably, these are debtors that hadn't yet paid their debt. He's already wasted or squandered the money he got from other debtors, right? He's already squandered that money, or he could have given that. So he goes and he looks for, who owes me money? i got to go find these folks that owe money. And uh, he says uh, to the first, how much do you owe? And notice he says, to my Lord. Now, I'll go ahead and mention here that context is extremely important, and Lord doesn't always mean Jesus or God in every parable, okay? We'll explain that as we get on down into the parable. Uh, but the Lord here is simply someone who is in charge, someone who's in control. The employer will say. So he says, how much owest thou unto my Lord? Now, the, the steward here understood, you don't owe me, right? It's my job to collect on his behalf. You don't owe me. Now, that gives us a sense of how much authority does this man have and how much authority is he going to take upon himself, okay? So he says, how much do you owe unto my Lord? And the man honestly says, I owe a hundred measures of oil, okay? Now, my understanding of a, a measure could have been seven and a half gallons to nine gallons, okay? So a hundred measures would be 750 to 900 gallons of oil. That's a lot, right? So that's what he, uh, that's what he owed, a hundred measures of oil. So the steward, who's in a pickle, he owes the Lord... And he doesn't have anything because he squandered it. He needs money fast. So what does he do? He says, well, I'll tell you what. If you'll pay me right now, because I need this money quick, just write down you owe 50. Fit, you, I'm going to give you 50% off what you actually owe. That's a good deal. For who? <laughs> the one who owed the debt. It's not a good deal for the one who was owed the debt. He's losing 50%. And who give this man authority to cut the bill in half? He wasn't given that authority, was he? But he took it upon himself. Why? Because he needed money quick, and he felt, if I can give the Lord some money as quick as possible, I can save my job. So he says, just write down there you owe him 50. Now, did the man owe him 50? No, he owed a hundred. He owed him a hundred. So here this steward is doing some wrong things, isn't he? He's cooking the books. If you, if you go to an extent here, and we don't know because this is a parable, but he might, be, he might be forcing the one who owed the debt to lie. I want you to, I want you to change the contract to say you owed 50. Well, what if I, owe, I didn't owe 50? I mean, if you charge 50, I'll pay 50. But I can't change the contract and write, I owe 50, because I actually owe 100. Now, I need somebody to tell me you've been forgiven of that 50, or I'm going to have to pay it. I'm not just going to change the contract. So this steward says, you write down 50. I'm not, don't tell me to lie, right? So the steward here is telling the people to lie, change it from 100 to 50. Then, of course, he's going to take the bill and say, this man owed you 50, I brought you 50. See what's happening? But that's not true, is it? The man owed him 100, and he only got 50. So then he goes to the second one, verse 7. He says, how much do you owe? And he says, I owe 100 measures of wheat. Uh, a measure of wheat, I think, was about 10 barrels, or bushels, I mean. So 100 times 10 would be 1,000 bushels of wheat. And he said, uh, well, take your bill and write that you owe 80 instead of 100. That's a 20% discount, 20% off. So once again, he's saying, take your bill and let's, let's take, you don't owe 100, you owe 80. Write that down. Now, it's one thing to say, I know you owe 100, but I'm only charging you 80. But for you to change that you owe from 100 to 80, right, is dishonest. So the steward's dishonest, and now he's calling upon other people to be dishonest. And, of course, they're tempted to be dishonest because they're saving money. 
So it seems that these, these folks that owed said, that's a great deal, I'll change it, right? I'll be, I'll be party to your lie. So, uh, so now, this steward has collected 50% of one debt and, and 80% of another debt. But he has quite a bit, doesn't he? He has 300 to 400 gallons of oil to give to the Lord, and he has about eight, uh, 800 bushels of wheat. So now he can give this to the Lord and, and say, I'm a good steward, right? I went and I, I collected your debts. And so when he takes this, verse 8, the Lord commends the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Now here's where it can get very complicated if you think Lord here refers to Jesus or to God. Okay? You can't make something apply to someone like Jesus or God if, we, if, if the thing being applied contradicts every other thing said about Jesus or God. Okay? So the Lord commends the unjust steward. How often would Jesus commend someone who did something wrong? Did Jesus ever commend people for lying? Did Jesus ever commend people for cheating their employer? Never, ever, ever did that ever take place. So we're not talking about Jesus or God here. We're talking about this employer who's a worldly man who's very rich, who's very rich. And all he cared about is getting his money. Well, now his steward brings him money, right? And lots of it. And so he says, you know, you're a good steward. You brought me what I wanted. You brought me what I needed. Now, as, some, as to application of this, there's, there's a number of ways we can go. Because number one, as I pointed out, this man in the parable, this is, a fig, this is figurative speech, right? This is a parable. It's not a, uh, it's not a, a, a real story. It's a, it's a story that explains a real meaning. So in, the, in our uh, parable, the Lord here has so much wealth that he doesn't even know he's being cheated until he's told. Okay? So in verse 8, when the Lord commended the unjust steward, did he commend the unjust steward because he said, the bill says he owed 50 and you brought me 50. Right? The bill said he owed me 80 and you brought me 50. 80. So is the, is, is the Lord in this parable saying, you're bringing me what those people owed me, and therefore you're a good steward? And of course the word unjust is put in there for our benefit to let us know that this man was a cheat. It's accommodative language. But the Lord in the parable may have not thought he was unjust. He may have just thought he did his job. I told him to do his job, he did his job. Or is the Lord saying, I know you cheated and you, you brought me half what I was owed and you brought me 80% of another I was owed, so you're still cheating me. But I'm going to consider you wise because that was a smart move. That was a smart move. Now it could be. This man might have been so rich that he said, now you're still cheating me. But boy, that was smart. The way you went about it was smart. You realized that you didn't have enough to keep your job, so you connived a way, very wily, deceptive way, to fool me so that you could keep your job, and I appreciate that. That may be the case. There are people like that today, right? There are people who are extremely wealthy who love it when somebody uh, is able to beat the system, right? And they're like, boy, I appreciate how his mind works. Now, he cheated me, but boy, he really thought long and hard about how to cheat me, and that was smart, wasn't it? Now, in whose eyes was that smart or wise? It wasn't in God's eyes. What would the unjust steward have done? If, if Jesus wanted to call this steward wise, what would the steward have done? He, number one, would have said, I have sinned, I have wasted 
all that I've done. I've been a bad steward. I don't have anything to give you. I've wasted it. That's what the prodigal did in, the, in chapter 15. right? That's what the good prodigal son did. So a good steward in the eyes of God who would have acted wisely would have said, I'm sorry, I sinned. But from now on, I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to go out and, and, uh, and I'm going to get what's owed to you. And then he may have said, look, what if I cut these folks' bill in half and got authority to do it first? Then maybe the landowner would have said, you know what? That's better than nothing, but this is the only time I'm going to let you do it. We're surmising here, right? But the idea here that God would consider this to be wise is not true. In the eyes of God, what would have been wise is for this man to admit his fault and admit sin. Admit that he had squandered the Lord's uh, money. Now, the Lord would have been within his rights to fire the steward. And that's the reason the steward said, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to do, tell the truth. I'm going to go out here and try to save my job. So in the, in the eyes of the world, those who place their trust in earthly wealth. This was a smart, shrewd move, wasn't it? That was a good business move. And there's a lot of people making good business moves today, and, and uh, they're stealing from all of us, <laughs> right? And they're, they're cheating, and they're causing uh, problems in a system that if everybody would just be honest and fair, it would be good and fair for everybody. But these people are shrewd. They're thinking hard. How do I get in there and I defeat the system? And in the eyes of the world, that's a good move, right? So whether it was the case that the Lord in this parable said, you went and you got exactly what the bill says because they had changed the bill, right? Or if he said, I know you changed the bill and I'm being cheated still, but boy, that was smart of you. Way to be a liar. That way you can keep your job. But you're a good liar, right? And maybe that's the case. Maybe he said, I like having good liars work for me. Because it was shrewd. It was good businessmen. Now, then he makes this statement. Now, would Jesus ever make this statement? <laughs> now, he did say it in the context of the parable. But this isn't what Jesus is commanding, is he? <laughs> for the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Well, it depends on your definition of wise, doesn't it? Wise doesn't always mean godly. Wise here, I think, uh, has to apply to this man's business acumen. He was very shrewd. Uh, he was uh, very cunning, right? He was deceitful. He wasn't afraid to be deceitful. Well, the world is a lot more deceitful than the children of light, right? I mean, that's a true statement. So the word wise here doesn't mean, does, it, this is not a commendation of these people cheating and lying and stealing. This is just simply saying when it comes to business and deceit and lying and shrewdness and being unjust, the world's going to win every time. Because the children of light would never do anything like that. Children of light wouldn't steal from one another. They wouldn't lie. They wouldn't call, ask people to lie, right? That's not what the children of light do. So that's the comparison here. When it comes to this kind of deceitful, disgusting behavior, the people in the world are going to win, okay? Children of light wouldn't have anything to do with that. Now, there are some who say, well, this teaches that, that well, you shouldn't lie and cheat and steal, but we should be shrewd like businessmen. No, I don't. Listen, the Bible teaches that we should be prudent and that we should be good stewards, right? The parable of the talents says that we should be good stewards and we should be prudent. And the Bible teaches that. But this, I, I believe that if someone tries to shove that in this verse, you're really trying to shove hard. Because why would Jesus say, now I want you to look at this shrewdness, the way this guy came up with these ideas, and they're bad ideas, and they're ungodly ideas, but boy, you all ought to try to think like that. 
except come up with good, except be righteous. That don't make sense, does it? Think like an evil person so you can come up with good things to do. Now, folks, that's what people in the church do when they look to the denominational world and say, look at the denominational world, how successful they are. Let's, let's do that now in the church. That's not what Jesus said to do. Jesus gave us a way to do it, and we ought to just do it his way. We don't need to take people's unjust, ungodly actions and try to be shrewd and say, let's apply that to us somehow. No, ungodliness leads to ungodliness. That's the reason this man's referred to as the unjust steward. Now, here's the whole point of, of all this. Well, once again, verse 9, let's, uh, he says, I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. Would God want us to be friends, close, tied, closely tied to people who were unrighteous? Make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness? In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, God said, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Is Jesus here contradicting himself and say, I want you to be as unequally yoked as you can be. I want you to be as shrewd as these people. No, what he's saying here is, you Pharisees, that's, you all love money, and if, that's, if, you're a whole, if you want to be of the world, you go be friends with them. In other words, if this is who you want to live with, if this is who you want to be in bed with, so to speak, then you go be with them. This is your people. These cheaters, these liars, these deceitful, unjust, righteous people, they're making a lot of If you want to be with them, you go be with them. That's your choice. Now, why do I say that? Because in verse 14, the Pharisees who were covetous, right, they, they loved that idea. What a great idea. I wish I'd have come up with that, right? We'll just change the bill. They derided Jesus for this. So Jesus said, if that's who you want to be, then you go be like that. But he says that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. I think Jesus here is being sarcastic. You'll remember this idea of habitations. When you fail... In other words, the unjust steward didn't fail, right, because he saved his job. But do you remember what he said, if I fail, what will happen? He said, if I fail, I'm going to lose my job and my house, my habitation, and I'm going to have to come back to somebody who has my job and rent from them. Remember? So I think, I think Jesus is being sarcastic and saying, look, if you want to be like these unjust people, you go be just like them. And that way, when you fail, you'll have an everlasting habitation. Were those people's habitations everlasting? Was that unjust steward's habitation everlasting? No, he was about to lose it. It wasn't everlasting, was it? He was about to lose it. And not only was he about to lose it, everybody else who wouldn't pay rent was going to lose theirs too. It wasn't everlasting. I think Jesus is saying here, if you want to put all your all your uh, love and trust into the, into the world, then you go do it, and that'll be your reward. And that'll be your everlasting habitation, except it's not everlasting. On the day of judgment, what will happen to their everlasting habitation? It'll be burned up. There's only one that everlasting habitation, and it doesn't go to unjust stewards. Okay? Verse 10 the only everlasting habitation goes to faithful stewards. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. In other words, if you'll be truthful and honest in this earthly life, when it comes to just little things, I mean just little things, and these are big things in our world, but in the grand scheme of things they're little. If you're willing to lie just to keep your job when your soul is at stake, if you're willing to lie about a little thing over here just because you don't want to hurt Joe's feelings, if you're willing to cheat somebody over here just to make sure that you would, you don't lose your job, if you're willing to be unfaithful in those little things, guess what else you'll be unfaithful in? 
everything to God, the big things. Right? That's, that's the whole point of this. If you're willing to, to get so mired in the muck with these shrewd, worldly thinking people, wise in the eyes of the world, the wisdom of the world, right? God said the wisdom of the wise will perish. If you're faithful in those little things, though, if a man said, I'm not going to lie, I owe a hundred, then you know who el what else he's going to be faithful in? He's going to be faithful in the big things. We might say the big things today are, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, that's a big thing. We're talking about salvation of the soul. We're talking about eternal salvation as opposed to eternal damnation. We're not talking about a little paycheck in this world. We're not talking about a job in this world. We're talking about eternal life after this one. If you're faithful in the little things, then you're going to be faithful in the big things. But if you're unfaithful in the little things, he that is unjust in the least is going to be unjust in the most. And this unjust steward, if he's willing to lie and cheat to save his job, what else is he willing to lie and cheat about? If he's willing to go to the end of the earth to make sure he saves his job, what about those people who were actually paying their debt? Right? Those people that were renting houses, let's say, and they were doing everything they were supposed to do. What if this steward said, I've wasted, my, I've wasted it again, I need more money? Do you think he might go to these people and say, you owe more? And if you, don't, if you don't give it to me, I'm kicking you out. That's the type of man we're talking about, right? He would do anything to save his job. He didn't care about others. So if, uh, then in verse 11, he says, If therefore have you not been faithful in the unrighteous things, the unrighteous mammon is how you get wealth in this life. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? Now here's the comparison Jesus is making. If you can't be trusted to take care of the wealth that will perish, who's going to give you the true riches? Why would I trust you with real riches? Eternal life, right? Salvation. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, the Lord in the parable, then Jesus said, if you're not going to be faithful to that man, you're not going to be faithful to me. If you're not going to be faithful to a human who can take away your house, you're not going to be faithful to me who can take your soul. And then verse 13, he says, you can't serve two masters. Either you're going to be a slave to the earthly wealth and the earthly ways of doing things, worldliness, or you're going to be a slave to doing things right. That's the whole point in it. That's the whole point. And in the context, verse 14, the Pharisees who were covetous didn't like any of these things. That explains the context. Well, I hope that that was time well spent. I wanted to uh, address these issues, and I wanted to be as specific as possible and to point out some things uh, about this parable to perhaps help us understand it a little bit more and hopefully the time was well served I hope it was uh, considered very beneficial on your behalf I think the concept that we find in accurately judging what was being said in this parable is in harmony with everything else Jesus said, isn't it? Come unto me. Take my yoke upon you. In other words, do what I say to do. That's what you need to do to be right. Don't look at the world and say, boy, that's a shrewd way of doing things. That's a that's a great way of getting things accomplished. Now, we don't want to have the same result. <laughs> no, do things God's way. Let's come to Jesus on his terms. Do it his way. And the golden rule, right? 
Matthew 7, verse 12. Paraphrase, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Right? I suppose that this unjust steward wouldn't want somebody wasting his livelihood, spending. right it's not treating others the way you'd want to be treated so if we do what God says to do if we come to Jesus on his terms so we treat Jesus and his word the way it should be treated and we treat one another the way they should be treated that's how we'll be considered just as stewards on the day of judgment and so today if you uh, seek to be a steward of Christ, you must first put on Christ. Baptism. Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 4. Prior to baptism, you must hear the word of God. You must believe it. You must repent of your past sins and put those behind you, not to do them ever again, and confess that Jesus is the way and the Christ, the Savior of the world. Then you're God adds those obedient individuals to his church and they become his stewards. And we're to do the Lord's bidding. And in that context, Lord means God and Christ. And we're to do things his way and not our own way. And if we'll be faithful in the little things and we'll be faithful in the big things, that means just be faithful in all things. Right? Don't make a judgment. Everything's big. If God wants us to do it, it's, it's what we need to do. It doesn't matter if you consider it little or big. Let's do it. And so if you have not obeyed the gospel, the invitation is extended. If you have already obeyed those initial acts, but perhaps you're not uh, as just as you once were, maybe you've gone back into the world, whatever your need is, we're here to assist you as we stand and sing.